So here we are back with Raf Bishops. Welcome, Raf. Hello. We are in the middle of Crohn's, Endoscopy Essentials, IBD Essentials. We spoke about scoring systems. But I think like 40% of Crohn's patients undergo surgery at some stage. Mm -hmm. And this leads us to the heart of the scoring in Leuven. Exactly. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about post-operative scoring and prediction, predictive values, etc. Yeah. So this goes back to one of my uh, trainers, Professor Rutgers, uh, uh, who uh, we celebrated the 40th anniversary of his score, actually, who had the idea uh, to assess this back, actually back in the area when uh, iliocolonoscopy was being invented ah. and it was very innovative and they were just doing this under x-ray to make sure they had no perforations. And he early, early on focused already on, on uh, IBD and especially on post-operative recurrences. Which was pretty special at that time, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Because everything was very broad and yeah. endoscopy was coming as a speciality only and yeah. he was subspecializing. Exactly. And it was also the time when you yeah. still could publish observational studies in gut yeah. and gastroenterology. <laughs> so, uh, but I he was one of your mentors, right? Exactly. Yes. A yeah. great person. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, so we do this in memory of him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very yeah. good. So, uh, so these are the so when we go postoperatively and we look at the uh, iliocolonic anastomosis. So um, there are actually four things we, uh, four grades we have. Actually, it could be totally normal, no lesions, and then you have the I one score uh, uh, where you have less than five uh, FTOS lesions, and those two are actually location wise. Yeah, at the, the anastomosis. At the anastomosis yeah. in the ileum, right? Uh, around that area, just fine. Because we are That's assuming like... that the main part of the disease has been removed. Exactly. So we're yeah. focusing on the anastomosis yes. yeah. and the postoperative score. Exactly. The rest of the colon goes with the normal score? Exactly. You can still apply the uh, simple yeah. endoscopic score for Crohn's disease. So there. this is an anastomotic score, this more or less. This is purely an yeah. endoscopic oh, okay. score. Yeah. So mm -hmm. you can add on the SESCD mm -hmm. on that. So you you score for the Rutgers score and then mm -hmm. uh, the rest of the colon if that would be inflamed as well. Um, so that's the that's the I one and I zero. We have to remember that because mm -hmm. that's important. Then we talked already about is this important for the patient. So we come back to that. And then we have the I three and I four. So this is when you have diffuse uh, aphthoiseliitis, diffuse inflammation. Uh, or even an I4 large ulcers with nodules and even, again, stricturing and narrowing. And then the difficult one is the I2, uh, where you have more than five aphthose lesions with normal mucosa between and skip areas of larger lesions or lesion or lesions confined to the illocolonic anastomosis. And especially that latter part was important and, and they changed that uh, afterwards because uh, it was assumed that that having these lesions at the uh, iliocolonic anast mm -hmm. anastomosis may actually also account for ischemia. Um, actually, I, I gave this presentation at UEG uh, this uh, UEG uh, week this year, and uh, one of the comments was that actually it's, it isn't really sure if this is in fact due to ischemia. It's often claimed like that, but for instance, after uh, colorectal surgery mm -hmm. for cancers, this is not seen like this, right? So this is may still be... It's a little bit more widespread. Yes, right? it's, yeah. Um, yeah. But it's difficult to really differentiate if it's only there. Exactly. And, and, and they realize that maybe there should be a distinction between that. And that's why they come up with the I2A and I2B. So when you have the lesions confined to the iliocolonic mm -hmm. anastomosis, as I, I just showed you, and they're less than five, and together with less than five of these small lesions in the ileum, or when you have more than five uh, aphthos ulcers in the ileum with normal mucosa uh, with or without anastomotic lesion. So the cutoff of five is still important, but the I2A score uh, allows this, uh, that you have lesions at the anastomosis together with up to five lesions in the ileum. Okay, and it's a pretty complex score. Yeah, yeah, you need you to have, have to a little paper a little in the room to, yes. yeah, yeah, or a reminder in your report. Uh, but in the end, you just need to count the 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 FTO ulcers. I think for I three and I four, it's not so easy. We can go through it. So, I mean, this is a, a postoperative uh, situation where there's no lesions in the distal ileum, so that's easy, right? Mm -hmm. So then it's not complicated to to assess the score, obviously. Um, here we have I1, where you can see this is what they call these small FTO lesions, right? So you, mm -hmm. it's typically like a a small wide space. Also, the base. flushing is important. Huh? Yeah, yeah. You need to clean a bit because sometimes you you will not be able to see the the lesions accurately. So this should be less than five, right, for the mm -hmm. uh, I one. 
uh, and these are the typical things you look for. So these are, it's also important to use the, the correct uh, terminology. So we don't call these ulcers, right? An ulcer is usually something that's deeper. Per definition, you, should, uh, you can fit your biopsy forceps into that. Like uh, that's the classical definition. Uh, here are lesions uh, confined to the ileocolonic uh, anastomosis. So this is obviously one of those cases. Okay, what do we do in the assessment? So here. Uh, a dilatation was performed because it was impossible to, to pass uh, that stricture. And then it's important in this case to, to assess and see that there's actually almost no information behind that stricture. So in this case, it's it's I2A where it's confined to the ileocolonic But that's anastomosis. also the kind of mucosa you are seeing after endoscopic resections in the early phase, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. You're right. Um, and then here we have the I2A as well. So lesions confined to the ileocolonic anastomosis. Uh, so after the, uh, uh, surgery. And then less than five. So you need to be able to count to five, Thomas, mm -hmm. to, to do yeah, the score. Okay. So in the end, maybe I, it's, I can do that. it's, it's not so difficult. Yeah, so, okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so when we have more than five, then uh, we go to the I2B. And the entire discussion, come back to that, is if, if this really matters. Uh, because you can see this is not severely inflamed. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there are definitely more than five uh, of these aftoid lesions in the ileum. Uh, and then it doesn't matter whether it's with or without anastomotic lesions in that particular case. <clears throat> For the I3, it's easier. Uh, so usually this is also combined not only with the ulcerations of the aftoid lesions, but also there's more like pus. You can see here there's this whitish um, uh, exudate. exudate that you can see. So there's many more than five. So it's, that's, that's, you don't even have to count here to see it's more than five. So, and also the inflammation is more prominent. So the mucosa is more red than in the previous uh, video. And then the I4, well, that's even more pronounced than you really have deeper and more confluent erosions and ulcerations you can see here where it's more pronounced. And you can also the red, see the, the redness of the mucosa that's more widespread, especially you go closer here to those to those villi. Uh, also more nodular mucosa here on the on the right side, on the left side, sorry. So these are the, the different stages. Uh, and the question then is what does that mean to the patient, I guess, right? So because we can have the score and it's very nice to put it there. But, but let's let's stop for a second here and try to summarize. So there are aftoid lesions. Mm -hmm. And then you count them, mm -hmm. and there is a cutoff to inflammation. Yes. So is that the cutoff? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. it's just the after lesion. So and between two and three. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I I zero and I one are mm -hmm. important. I'll come back to that in mm -hmm. a minute. The I two is difficult. So but five is the, the the real cutoff because if you go above that, then you are at three, and that is important for the patient for patient's further management, mm -hmm. right? Um, okay. So the problem is, I mean, what does this all mean? Uh, so uh, if you go back to the, the first paper from Professor Rutgers, you can see that actually, uh, if you look at the endoscopic appearance of the anastomosis, in many cases, like 72, 79, 77 percent after one, uh, two, three years, you can see that there are signs of inflammation. Um, and recurrence means without medical therapy, or how does that did that interfere in that study? Well, that depends a little bit on the risk factors of the patients. So if patients are on biologicals and they have the risk factors, mm -hmm. like they're young, they, are, they smoke, uh, and they're male, then, then they will have uh, ongoing therapy. But uh, so to stop the therapy completely, in those days it was without therapy, mm -hmm. right? So that's oh, okay. also a little bit yeah, different from now. But anyway, mm -hmm. whether you put a patient on or off therapy after surgery depends on the risk factors that are associated with that. Um, and then you're going to assess the patient six months after that. So that's where this actually fits into the algorithm. Um, but the problem is, what does it mean if you have these small uh, erosions, if it's less than five? Uh, because it's up to 88% of the patients had uh, these findings, but uh, the doesn't really mean that they had symptoms. Often this was without clinical recurrence. Um, and that is obviously important because if we, if we look here at, at this figure, you can see that Indeed, after one year, 73% had an endoscopic recurrence, which is a lot. But if you look at what does it, what does it imply in terms of uh, having symptoms, uh, you can see that 
uh, the, the survival without symptoms here, this curve is already higher. So fewer patients have uh, symptoms, uh, fewer patients have also uh, inflammation in the lab, and even fewer patients have a need for mm -hmm. redo surgery. Although many do have a need for redo surgery in the end, as you can see about 20% here uh, after uh, eight years. So, and why is then the score important? Well, it is important because uh, when we have this minimal inflammation, I0 or I1, which is in 40% of the cases, or when we have the severe inflammation, then we know what we have to do. In the first case, we can just say, okay, we can wait and see, right? Mm -hmm. Because we know in those cases, indeed, they have a lower rate of recurrence. In case of I3 and I4, you can see that the curves is completely different, yeah. and then we need to start or switch therapy. So, so this was our cutoff, you know? Above exactly. three, it has to be treated anyway. Exactly. Yeah? Because it's still inflamed. Absolutely, yeah. or re-inflamed, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, what we do with this intermediate score, mm -hmm. which is still about 20-25% of the patients? Mm -hmm. And that's a little bit difficult. So uh, there's actually, the data is not so clear about it and a little bit contradicting. So, uh, <clears throat> for instance, here you can see a study from a couple of years ago, multi-center retrospective study, not so many patients, and actually there was not so much difference in the end between I2A or I2B. Um, and then a bigger piece of evidence from Pauline Riviere, uh, which is a, a seven studies with more patients, 400, um, and a long-term follow-up of almost five years. Again, no big difference between the two. So you might say, well, it doesn't really matter that much to the patients. But more recently, there was a, a, a multi-center retrospective database from six uh, centers and even more patients from Holland. Uh, and here it was shown that actually there is a difference between this I2A when there's less than five after ulcers or when it's uh, um, not confined only to the ileocolonic anastomosis. And actually, if this I2B, there was associated with more surgical recurrence. So this is actually a piece of evidence that supports the fact that uh, if you have uh, the I2B score, that at least, well, you should have a, a very tight monitoring or uh, really consider changing therapy. So this is the discussions they have in the mm -hmm. MDTs about these scores for the I0, I1, it's clear. The others also, they need to switch. And here, at least there should be yeah. a closer follow-up and you should not put your head on the ground and say there's nothing going on here. Especially right? with newer forms of therapy. Maybe. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Aiming at more thorough healing. And also combine mm -hmm. it with biomarkers. Mm -hmm. But like, for instance, if you have a patient who is like in after six months has I0, I1, we say, okay, you're safe. We, mm -hmm. we follow you up with biomarkers. In case of uh, I2B and I2, you will be more careful and then say, okay, we might, maybe we do those biomarkers more frequently and if necessary, mm -hmm. have a relook uh, uh, to see if we need to uh, intensify the therapy. Okay, it's also an evolving field, mm -hmm. right, to look at the anastomosis. Uh, with all these considerations, it's very complex, but does the status of the remaining colon also play a role? Of so, course. So if that is inflamed, yeah. then the anastomotic classification doesn't matter. Yeah. Is that correct? That's correct. And there is there is a potential that patients have also colonic disease mm -hmm. involvement after ileo uh, right hemocolectomy. Mm -hmm. Uh, although actually very often the shift between phenotypes is possible, but most of the patients who are in one phenotype usually stay there. So those with ileocecal disease and the right colon disease, usually they stay and have disease at the uh, at, uh, anastomosis afterwards. But obviously this is possible and that would also trigger the need for, for additional therapy. And when is the first control usually? Six months. Surgery, six yeah. months. So according to the guidelines, mm -hmm. uh, when, when you say I'm going to do mm -hmm. endoscopic control, that should be six months after surgery. Yeah. Any role, we spoke about ultrasound, any role of ultrasound here as well to look yes, at the anastomosis or is it more difficult? Well, it's definitely something you need to train for. I'm not trained in that, mm -hmm. but we have a colleague uh, who is definitely trained in that and who gives courses. And it's definitely an evolving field again. Uh, especially to be reassured, so if the intestinal abdominal ultrasound is normal, uh, together with the fascia scalp protectin, mm -hmm. they suggest that you actually can uh, just do the same Post as postpone do, uh, endoscopy. Yeah, postpone, mm -hmm. postpone or mm -hmm. even avoid endoscopy and follow up. In case when and I can't remember actually the cutoff. I have to look it up in the guideline. I think it's about five millimeters of intestinal wall, if I remember well. Uh, if that's if that's more than that, then you should do the endoscopy mm -hmm. anyway. So if there's any doubt with the intestinal, yeah. but if it's really reassuring, 
uh, then uh, the correlation also with the I0 and I1 score is actually quite good. So this is an evolving field, but again, it's operator dependent, so it requires definitely training, while an I0, I1 score is quite easy to assess, I think. Yeah, I mean, with all those imaging procedures, I think ultrasound and endoscopy, one of the disadvantages was the lack of standardized documentation. Mm -hmm. So if you go to MRI, CT, it's always there. Standardized, and everybody in the world can look at it. Mm. I think we have to become better in that, right? Oh, absolutely. I couldn't agree mm. more. Yeah. I find it personally very mm. frustrating that in 2025 almost, that uh, we do an imaging uh, speciality and, and many reports lack especially that. Yeah, so it's still among a, the yeah. best kept secrets. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Now, ultrasound and then depending on ultrasound and also depending on the center and expertise, etc., yes, etc. Yeah. Et but I think IBD and Crohn's patients, they love to save endoscopies, I guess. So uh, that's yeah. something we have to watch out for. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Good, Raph. Thank you very much. This concludes our two Crohn's sessions and uh, we'll be back with ulcerative colitis. <laughs>